Hi, Melissa. Hi. So, welcome. Um, could you tell us who you are and what you do and uh, why you are excited about this trans tech space? Sure. So, I am a uh, UI UX designer. I've been working in tech for about 20 years. I work with a lot of early stage startups to uh, kind of launch them it, either to their first MVP or, or just a prototype to get funding. Um, and I'm really, really interested in like the trans tech area. Um, I, I love working on apps that are going to like elevate humanity. And so the main one I'm working on right now is called Sonic Sleep, and it's an app that's all around helping you sleep better, um, especially if you have like sleep conditions, but also if you're just a regular person and want a better night's sleep. And um, it's like a bunch of scientists that have all this data on like the appropriate sounds to play at certain times in your sleep cycle in order to help you get a better night's rest. Nice. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on? Sure. Uh, so I have a company called Data Garden, and our first product is a device that attaches to plants and turns their biometrics into music so you can listen to the sound of the plants. And uh, we are scaling out the software that we're building to that to license the human wearables to create a biometric entrainment platform that allows you to listen to the biorhythms of your own body. Nice. This is square in the middle of the, what Transformative Tech is all about. Right on. In fact, it's so in the middle that you're going to be at our next event. So that's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Hi. Hi. Welcome to our event. Uh, can you tell us uh, your name and uh, what brought you here today? Uh, my name is Miley Mallon and uh, I am in Hack for Life with Wes. Um, and I also am a UX designer at eHarmony currently. Oh. Yeah. oh, wow. So I was curious to know what the algorithm, algorithm was before, how it was built before, because currently um, we're kind of trans migrating platforms to a, a new system. So I, I'm really interested to see how it was built initially and what the thought process was behind that. Um, but yeah, also, I'm in a like my meditation program, so I like to kind of see which in which ways we can like use tech for good. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, what brought you here? Um, I'm Silvio, I'm a filmmaker. And I was uh, last month already at your event, and this was so great that I just uh, immediately bought a next ticket. <laughs> so and now I checked it out. Also, what is this about today? And very interesting again. And yeah, I'm just generally like very interested in science. Uh, many years ago, I got into it, and and I think it's great what you're doing here with this, these events and the, the whole nonprofit organization. Very cool. Dr. Bakul, thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. Yeah, we're looking forward to your talk later. Um, so I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions before we, before we start. Um, what is, in your research right now, what, is, what are you most excited about? What I think is most exciting right now is finding ourselves at a transition point where the use of psychological information at scale is increasing almost every every day. I think in the past, psychometrics has been a very rigorous science that required people to take uh, exhaustive questionnaires. But now, with all the information that people are putting on the on social media, particularly, it makes it quite possible, particularly with the use of deep learning models, for us to be able to understand people's psychological characteristics uh, quite accurately just from their interchanges on the internet. And while that's hugely exciting, uh, from a psychologist standpoint, I think, you know, we'll, we'll truly be able to interact with people as individuals, but yet the, the flip side of it is that that information can be used to manipulate people, to, uh, you know, sell them things they don't want to buy, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a good that was, that was actually my next question. So where does privacy <laughs> policy come into play here? Yeah, that, that's something we're going to spend a, a good bit of time talking about. Um, at, at some point, there's going to have to be a way for people to protect their personal 
psychological information. I, I think the blockchain has a lot of potential as, as providing a, a model like that would work in that regard, where people may even agree to take tests or something, keep the results as, as part of their um, you know, ledger, and companies would have to pay to access. Um, you know, that's one model, um, but I think in the, in the shorter term, we're going to have to, um, the, the people that are developing these, these models are going to have to take it upon themselves to be fully transparent with what they're using, people's you know, text and their, their images, their voices, um, what they're using that for. And we're going to talk more about that later today, yes? Yeah, very, very much so. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Dimitri. I'm the um, Los Angeles chapter lead for Transformative Tech. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Philosophy, our host. And Ben is uh, going to say a couple of words. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Philosophy. We're a design and development agency, and so we design products across all sorts of different industries. And uh, we also do some robotics, as you can see, this is the robot area. Um, and uh, yeah, if you guys, if anybody here needs some you know, help thinking through their idea, validating their concept, or building it and making it real and testing it with real customers, this is a great place to, to uh, do it. So anytime you want to talk to us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you again for having us, Ben. Uh, so uh, I normally, this, this is our sixth event, and I normally do a five to 10 minute uh, spiel about transformative tech, what we're all about, what we do. Uh, in a nutshell, we are a um, global community of entrepreneurs and innovators working on using technology for inner well-being. Um, so, Another way to think of this is the upper levels of the Maslow pyramid. Um, so most companies and governments focus on the bottom two layers. We focus on the top, so the inner stuff. Uh, that's one way, good way to look at it. So what we do is uh, a couple things. We have a conference. We have uh, an accelerator, which happens uh, in the fall of this year. Um, a couple of other things. But uh, every, right now, we have chapters in 15 cities. LA is one of them, and we organize events. So this is our, like I said, it's our sixth event. Um, our events, what we try to do is um, have a mix of education and kind of uh, an immersive experience. So at our last event, we talked about the science of um, sensory resonance. So it's when you sync your uh, visual, uh, oral, and uh, tactile senses uh, to create a very kind of a meditative experience. And then we experience that experience live. So today we're going to talk about the, the science of psychometrics um, and then we're going to participate in the research um, on this in the, in the psych panel. So thank you very much Dr. Buckwalter for, for being here. We're very excited to have you. Um, so Dr. Buckwalter is, uh, was the original chief scientist at eHarmony who came up with their algorithm and he's been doing a lot of really interesting things since then uh, so we're going to learn more about that today. So the other thing we do as the uh, TransTech global community is um, kind of cultivate the community. Right? So it's not just doing events once a month, but doing other things. And so one of the one of the ways we've been doing that is <coughs> uh, you know, facilitating conversations. So honestly, the best thing about our events, according to many of you, is the people that you meet uh, here. Uh, so we, we happen to attract a really good group of people. So thank you all for coming. Um, so. One of the other things that's been really helpful is um, this thing on LinkedIn called Find Nearby. So if you, um, if you want to take a second and open up your phones and open up your LinkedIn app, mm -hmm. um, this is really cool. So this is going to allow you to connect uh, with everybody here. Um, 
or not everybody, but people you want to connect with. So if you go to uh, LinkedIn and click on the, uh, the heads icon, the two heads, um, then at the top of your screen, you're going to find the menu, find uh, nearby. So if you click that and enable it, it's basically going to show you everybody uh, who's in this room. And it's just that you can connect with them right away. So it's a quick way to, uh, to meet them. Yeah, nice. Oh, yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, if somebody requests to connect with you and you don't want to do it, you have, it, it, it kind of sucks that they, they see you. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing we, we, we'd like to do at, uh, at our events is that we'll call open forum. So um, it's really, it's not just a one-to-one -one, um, conversation, it's a way for uh, all of you to talk about whatever you want to talk about uh, that's uh, relevant to our, uh, to our cause. So this time, I know, uh, Josie, you wanted to say a couple of words about sure. uh, VR and AR, yeah. Yeah, did you want to Yes, please. Oh. Thank you, Dimitri. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Josie, and um, I work in the product space as a product manager. And part of the reason why I wanted to address the community today is one, of course, I'm t passionate about technology, um, but I'm also particularly interested in the intersection between humanity and tech. Right. So we talk about inner well-being and technology becoming more and more integrated as a daily part of our living. And internet is almost a commodity nowadays, especially in urban areas. Um, what I wanted to challenge the community with today is what we'll do a quick uh, mini intro. So show of hands, how many of you feel confident that if you were not able to see, if you were blindfolded, that you would be able to use your iPhone or Android phone? Show of hands, like confident, like texting, social network, emails. Okay, I don't see any hands. <laughs> okay, I see Dimitri in the back. Um, how many of you are aware of what are alternatives for folks that are sight impaired or blind or hard of hearing? I see a few maybe hands here. And, and I think this is part of a larger conversation I wanted to bring to the community, right? We have the, the continued sophistication of voice activation technology. We have the rise of AI and AI being used to do image processing, facial recognition. Um, we have the, you know, we've all played those fun games where you're moving and the camera can tell what you've done and it can mimic it back. So all these different areas, uh, where we are really seeing a continued sophistication of them. And my question to the community is, do you feel that, um, one, are folks that are sight impaired or hearing impaired, do you feel that they're an underserved community? Um, or to, and two, do you feel that these technologies could be more closely integrated in order to serve those communities? You want to stand here? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear um, what you guys think. Yes, I see. Someone was pointing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I just think something. absolutely um, they deserve to, to be, um, that the technology would serve them in a, in a better way, because it's absolutely possible that it's uh, developed to a higher degree. And why do you guys think that that hasn't become a mainstream thing yet? Well, because for me, my friends who are hearing impaired or sight impaired, they already got it covered. They already know <coughs> what is available to them, mm -hmm. and so they seek it out themselves. And uh, they also know how to develop it to the next generation. Uh, that's useful to themselves. <coughs> they're actually very proactive in participating with the next gen technology, specifically to, to their needs and abilities. Yeah. So it just doesn't get covered in the media because same reason the media doesn't cover Native American stuff mm -hmm. because they don't think it's interesting to the general population. And the media is owned by business owners who accept. So, so you don't think it's an issue that needs to be addressed further? You think well, it's all my solved? friends, um, I only can talk about my personal direct experience. My friends who are hearing impaired and sight impaired, they, like I said, they've already got it covered. They already know which technologies are available to them and how to improve it. Um, but I do know one of my friends who is uh, um, a sign language teacher, 
he, he goes to parts of the states where people still have never met anybody who knows how to sign. Yep. So there's still a lot of population in the U.S. where um, people don't have any resource whatsoever at all. And, and I think that's a, that's a great point to bring up because, um, you know, as a product manager, I'm always challenged with great product ideas, but not necessarily engineering jobs to, to build them. And I think one of the challenges is there are even dialects within sign language, and there have been attempts to develop um, a universal app where you could hold up a camera um, on your phone and uh, the camera is watching motions being done by someone in sign language and then translating that into text. So if I were to sign thank you, um, the camera would pick up on that motion and write thank you as a text. So there isn't a need to necessarily speak sign language in order to communicate with somebody in sign language. Um, and the same technology is used for what's called a universal communicator. So we're seeing the rise of if I'm speaking French to someone, uh, that can be translated in English back to them. They can speak into their phone. That's translated back into French, uh, back into French, so I can understand. And so, what I feel is sort of there's a trend of technology to kind of unify um, and, and integrate um, us across boundaries and borders. And uh, although there are communities that definitely seek it out, almost I, I can imagine because they have to. I myself don't have any um, impairments, but. Um, I'll tell you, it, I can definitely feel the challenge. I had an injury many years ago where I lost part of my sensory experience and I really had a lot of empathy and understanding of how life would be very different. So I just kind of wanted to challenge that to the community. Do you have anything to add to me? Um, I, I would say something which is yeah. um, look outside the U.S. as well as mm -hmm. internally. Uh, Canada, for instance, because it's a socialist country, uh, everybody in the country is represented on TV, so they have the Differently Abled channel, which addresses the needs of the community, which is differently abled. And so they do have some technologies in place that they use in the broadcast network, uh, where people can interact with it at home. So there's lots of stuff going on. I absolutely agree. I, I wanted to hear, um, just because we're, we're I'm surrounded by a community of folks that, I, do I see a hand there? Yeah. <coughs> You brought a point that reminded me of something. I was in uh, a spirit rock meditation t two, three weeks ago, and for the first time they were offering what was being offered by the teacher to the people who are hard of hearing, mm -hmm. to deaf people, and there was, there were two people who were doing the sign language thing, and it was so much effort to get the meaning across, even for those short periods that they were in conversation. Not a conversation, just the talk of the teachers actually, because it was silent. But there was so much effort in there that I can tell you, the 70 people who were there, their heart was like involved in the emotions of these two translators for these people. So I think if there is any way that can make these people have more access to anything that people with hearing can have, that's a brilliant step forward. And, and, I, and I would say, like, I would add to that, it's uh, a lot, there is, I feel that there is a bias um, when we develop new technology for, and we, for folks that are fully sensory enabled. And, um, you know, for a lot of us, we associate loss of hearing, loss of sight with old age. And I'll be honest, I'll, I see a very young and smartly crowd, but, you know, if we continue to develop technology um, and we don't take into account the full spectrum of our health and well-being and how we receive and interact with technology. I myself am worried that, uh, you know, once I get older in age, that how, how, how is the technology landscape going to look and how am I going to be still a part of it and how can I still be um, interactive with everyone in the community. So, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for sort of hearing me out. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. And um, I mean, one of the things we're looking, looking to try to do more of is uh, create the kind of the engagement between our events. So it's not just the one once a month thing we get together, uh, but continue the conversation after that as well. Um, so we have a Facebook group, um, and then um, we're thinking about other ideas for what, what we could do, uh, workshops and other things like that. Um, so if you have any ideas on what um, what we could do to kind of Bridge this community closer. Uh, please, let's uh, let's talk. 
So, uh, before, before we get started with our main program, uh, so first Dr. Mark Walter is going to talk about his research. Uh, then, um, in the second part of the event, we're going to take a, uh, so we're going to participate in this research by taking a survey. So, it would help us if you uh, registered for that survey now, uh, and then we'll, we'll, everything will go faster once we get started. So, if you go to thereserveprincipal.com, and create an account, and then uh, don't do anything else. And then once once you're done, uh, once we're done with the presentation, we'll uh, begin to that. All right. Thereserveprincipal.com. Thereserveprincipal.com. All right. Thank you. <coughs> That, that's just a, um, a WordPress um, login that you'll create. And I'll uh, be talking a um, fair amount towards the end about the, uh, the assessment that you'll be helping us validate, um, as well as uh, hopefully give me feedback on the profile that you get. Um, and help us kind of uh, do, do a, as good as we can with that, that assessment. Um, science of psychometrics. I mean, we're at the, the root, we're dealing with our brain. Most potentially one of the most complex organisms um, in the universe. I mean, 100 billion neurons, each with 10,000 connections. Um, but all of that organized in very specific ways to produce experiences for us, to allow us to understand and perceive our world, um, to act in our world. Um, and it, a, a lot of this happens through the, or, the way the brain itself is organized. Um, we know that you know, our frontal lobe is what makes us uniquely human. That our ability to plan and to, um, you know, enjoy a sunset, um, all in our frontal lobes, um, our, our deep underneath, you know, our um, mouth, kind of up at the top roof of our mouth, um, that area, you know, the basal ganglia, deep movements and uh, repetitive uh, motions. It's like, you know, evolution has just grown from, you know, the, this brain that, um, you know, just w was basically a perceptual, um, you know, organism that wended its way through life. Um, then uh, so much happened once we started living in groups, um, it, I, I make the argument that living in groups is when evolution developed what we call personality, which is going to be the, the topic that we're going to talk quite a bit about tonight. Um, but for, for organisms, to succeed as groups, it, 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 if we were all exactly the same, it's not going to happen. We need diversity of preferences, of skills, of weaknesses, um, if we're going to be able to function effectively. That's still something, you know, companies are always trying to figure out 
what the key is to group successful groups. Um, time and time again, it's like diversity in how people think. I mean, if you have, if you have everyone thinking the same, you're not going to, you're not going to advance as a group. Um, psychometrics is, addresses kind of our innate desire to understand what makes us different. Um, how can we explain those differences? Um, this is one way of doing it. Um, this was the path that psychology basically took over the past 100, 120 years, um, where starting around the time of World War I, uh, when people started to notice that a fair number of people were coming back from this horrific war with a condition that they called shell shock. But other people were coming back and were fine. Um, that was really the impetus for academics to start to try and define individual differences. Um, after that, there, pretty much through, throughout a lot of the 1900s, everybody, every psychologist at least, and you know, their, their brother had a theory on what personality was all about. You know, Freud had his theory that it was, you know, unconscious early um, attachments and development. Um, Hyung had the archetypes that, that defined us. Um, and honestly, it wasn't until um, 1980s that what was originally called a five-factor model um, came into vogue, which in uh, 2000 was expanded into a six-factor model um, that's most commonly referred to as the hexaco. Um, to my way of thinking, this reflects one of the major scientific advances of our time. I mean, we finally have a model of personality that's rock solid. You go anywhere in the world, you, you look at the, the language that people are expressing, and you, you know, do some NLP on it. These six factors are going to emerge. These dimensions of thinking, of feeling, of believing, exist everywhere. And they're incredibly powerful. To, to just start to get this lens of, okay, you know, this person is high honesty, you know, not, not social justice warrior kind of high honesty, but, you know, more like, uh, you know, the peace and justice kind of guy. And, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, at, when you develop this lens, you, you have a way of getting the basics of who these, who someone is. Um, it's also a great way to understand who yourself, who you are. Um, something that we'll, we'll spend a, a fair amount of time talking about tonight um, and asking you to participate in a new, um, new, test, but the test that you will take will also give you um, a report on your hexaco. So if you don't know where, where you uh, come out on these six dimensions, um, you'll get that if you uh, take the time to take the, uh, the test. 
Um, something that we also find very helpful in um, giving people information is to simply identify the, the predominant um, difference that you have. So, you know, on these six dimensions, which one are you furthest away from the mean and is that high or low? Um, and that's a really quick and not, not entirely satisfying understanding of yourself, um, but it, it, it gives you something to, to hang your hat on um, and, you know, something, you know, people, people like to, to have a, a type, so we typically give them that, although we definitely prefer that you look at all, all six dimensions if you really want uh, to better understand yourself. Um, so with the Hexaco, we have, for the first time ever, a universal agreement amongst academics on what the basics, basic dimensions that define our individuality. Um, now, how does this all tie into eHarmony? Um, it, it, most of you who were around in the 2000s watching cable TV, um, it was impossible not to, uh, not to see Dr. Neil Clark Warren um, during that time. He was the um, elderly gentleman uh, that did all the, uh, the eHarmony commercials. Um, but he had been an acquaintance of mine um, for a long time. He um, knew that I was a research um, scientist. He approached me with his observation after like 30 some years of doing couples uh, therapy that his conclusion was there, there was a significant per portion of the couples that he saw that he could do nothing for, that they were fundamentally mismatched, that, you know, it was just oil and water, um, that, you know, the, the one partner, you know, said hi, the other person said low. It just did not really, you know, jive. They just didn't like each other on some fundamental level. And when that's the case, what's a you know psychologist to do? I mean, if there if there are clear kind of injuries in a relationship, you know, where you have things to work with, uh, and there's motivation to move forward, but um, that that wa was not his his thinking. Um, so his, his question to me was it possible for us to do the research uh, to help individuals who are looking for partners to avoid those absolutely bad matches. So we took three years uh, to do um, research on what what the literature suggested at that time um, are around what helped a marriage be successful. Primarily, there wasn't real consensus, but there was some um, understanding that personality, that your values, that your interests were all important to, to understand about your partner. So that's kind of what we started out with. We developed this um, initially really torturously long 400 plus item questionnaire um, that the investors just hated. It's like, nobody's going to take this. And um, I have, 
uh, an interesting point. I think the fact that um, because it kept a lot of, you know, it was a sub significant barrier to entry, uh, particularly for a lot of guys, because um, the, the, the state of dating when we started eHarmony, which was around 2000, um, it was really these guy-oriented sites um, who were just looking to expose things that women didn't want to see. Um, you know, and, and a, a, as a result, women avoided dating sites by and large, um, they, they were not safe, they weren't enjoyable. Um, so along comes eHarmony, you have to answer a 400 item survey. Uh, it's like, uh, maybe not. Um, but the people that waded through it, um, oh, all right. So there was some uh, level of commitment there uh, just to get through that. Um, and you know, how we developed our matching model was um, we went to married couples, wide ranges of married couples, um, gave them our, our questionnaire, and also um, asked them to take a marital satisfaction survey. Then we developed our model to predict marital satisfaction, thinking that if we can predict very successful marriages, that we can do that for singles, we're gonna have the same result. Um, fortunately, you know, it seems like, um, it seems like it worked. Um, back in its heyday, 4% of marriages in the U.S. Uh, met through eHarmony. Um, these uh, graphs on the on the uh, left are ones that indicate different aspects of satisfaction with your relationship. Um, you can see that the the really high blue bar is um, eHarmony, where people are more likely to feel warm and comfortable in their marriage. Um, it's a rewarding marriage. It's um, a general more satisfaction. Um, but the, the real, you know, money that we hoped, I mean, the, you know, when we were working on this, you know, every, every founder, you know, has, you know, the wild-eyed dream uh, for what the company is going to do, you know, our our wild-eyed dream was we were going to change the divorce rate by one percent in the United States. Um, if you know this is accurate, you know we're we might even have two percent, um, the which is is stunning. Um, in all honesty, as a hardcore researcher, there are flaws with this. I, I had mentioned earlier that um, the fact that eHarmony is not a select, or is not a random population. You know, the mere fact that you have to answer, uh, the survey is much shorter now, but it's still, you know, a barrier to jump through. Um, eHarmony has always had kind of a squeaky clean brand uh, that it's, you know, for people that are serious. So it's quite possible that the people that we're getting in there are not the same as the people that are going to other sites. So from a, a, a purely scientific standpoint, that that's a criticism I don't think we'll ever be able to answer, you know, a hundred percent. But in in the um, you know in, in the 
long term, I think that it certainly gives credence to using psychometrics at scale. Um, yet, you look or, you know, when I was at eHarmony, I, I was, you know, the reason I left was because I wanted to, like, do eHarmony for jobs. I wanted to do eHarmony for, you know, lawyers, for, you know, every, I mean, every relationship that you have, you know, why wouldn't you want to know what that profile was and what the, the ideal matches were? Um, they didn't want to, um, to fund that at the time. Um, but, you know, since then, I've been, um, you know, trying like crazy to <laughs> get, get um, psychometrics at scale. Um, this is one um, instance where uh, I did, for a period of time, work at a a fintech um, where we never um, use psychometric information in the um, financial risk modeling, even though when we used it, we, we consistently got a three to five percent boost in our ability to predict default. Um, this gives you, you know, some information on that. The, the up the top are the different types. Just using, you know, a real quick and dirty um, formulation of, of someone's personality. We see someone that the, ro the rock, those are people low emotionality. You know, they're just rational as can be. Um, they, they were made for the, the financial services, you know, industry. Um, ver, whereas somebody, the free spirit, are low conscientious, little disorganized, maybe a little r bit of rebellion thrown in there to, just for good luck. Um, and they're terrible in, in, with, with money, with our, you know, the way the financial services industry is set up. Um, so, but what we did um, that at uh, at payoff um, that that worked out really well for them was to train the customer service reps on the different types, and they knew when somebody called in what their type was, and they had cheat sheets on how to develop a relationship with the person, how to diffuse anger, how to manage conflict. Um, and, you know, the, the NPS score they had was just through the roof consistently. Um, so hopefully I could take some credit for that. Um, the Hexaco, it, you know, if you just look at uh, the literature, um, it, it predicts so much of what we do in life. Um, you know, both, both on a positive uh, perspective and on a negative perspective. Um, yet, by and large, this information about us is unknown to ourselves and unknown to those that we work with. Um, what uh, I'm spending a lot of time with now is um, using deep learning models to start to understand personality and emotions um, just from people's uh, social media. So, and we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this as we go along. Um, but I, I wanted to, to show you this just as an example of what we can do um, just on Twitter looking at 
people's emotions. The, this is people that, that talked about Kate Spade um, the day before uh, her suicide. You see the, the high uh, yellow is happiness. Uh, the, the low ones are anger, fear, disgust, sadness. Um, that, that very day that she committed suicide, you know, the sadness just skyrockets. And this, this is just from tweets, just from analyzing the, the text uh, of, of words. Um, it, it, it's incredibly powerful information that is out there. Um, sentiment, you know, everybody hears about sentiment. Um, we actually d uh, look at 11 different emotions. Um, emotion, you know, like personality really um, it are kind of long-term traits um, that, that we all have. Uh, our personality changes somewhat over the lifespan, particularly at major events, like, you know, when um, kids go to college, they typically, you know, their openness score goes up quite a bit. Um, when people get married, uh, particularly men's um, extroversion comes down a fair amount there. Um, but that's, uh, I, I mean, an amazing piece of evolutionary biology. When men get into monogamous relationships, almost to the day, testosterone levels go down. Um, so you don't, you don't have to be on the hunt, you know? We, so we, we, uh, the nature needs us to do something else. Um, so, um, but, but the emotions are, um, without knowing where someone is at emotionally, um, it's still hard to use the personality to know how to interact with someone in the moment, um, you know, which is where we, hope to take all of this. Um, so just in case you can't see, this is IBM Watson. So IBM um, spending a lot of effort now in un using uh, deep learning to understand both personality and emotions. Um, they're selling this to companies um, for a wide range of purposes. Um, but what I find um, most troublesome about this, you know, movement that I'm involved in uh, was, um, was highlighted in this book, uh, Spotify Teardown. Um, which is something to my way of thinking is when, it, when it's all said and done is going to make Cambridge Analytica look small um, because what, what's happening is that Spotify, I mean there, there's nothing that appeals to our emotions more than music, you know, whether, whether we're high, whether we're low, um, you know, we, we go to music uh, to, to help us. Um, Spotify has figured our emotions out to a T, and they're selling our emotions. Um, they're not telling anyone about this, um, but they are starting to develop a whole industry around commodifying our emotions, um, which is, is just all wrong. Um, the anecdote for this is um, something that, that we call digital humanity. Um, 
I mean, we're all dealing, we're, we're on the cusp of understanding humans and having a digital human interaction that's going to be truly personalized, which I think we would all say is a good thing. That, you know, the, the more that we, you know, go online and, you know, the, 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 we, we don't even have to search, you know, we, things would, you know, I, I mean, the, the machine would understand us well enough to, um, you know, know what we're feeling that day and would, you know, make us, you know, give us the information that we want that would, you know, maybe change our feelings, maybe deepen our feelings. Um, it, you know, this, this, is, this is what we want, but we don't want it shoved down our throats. We don't want it to be done to us without full awareness. Um, and I think the only way that that's going to happen is if, you know, propeller heads like are sitting around the room, um, that we start to work together um, to, to draw some limits on how AI is developed. Um, you know, we, we all talk about, you know, the singularity and uh, super intelligence, um, but why aren't we talking about, you know, super empathy, um, you know, super compassion? Um, I, I, I mean, and people say, oh, well, that, that's, that's such a, a squishy emotion. Well, give me a break. Uh, intelligence is, isn't, a, you know, a straightforward process either. Um, I, I mean, if we wanted to teach machines how to be empathetic, of course we can do that. We're ju we just don't make it a priority. Um, and that's what I'm challenging, you know, the, the trans tech community to start considering. Um, because, you know, if we don't, the Spotify's are, I mean, they got the money. They, they can do the stuff that we've been dreaming of doing for, you know, years now. But they're, you know, they have the budget to, to be doing it. Um, and, it, you know, it's so powerful. Um, but it could be so good if we did it right. We don't have to you know, just let, let the, you know, genie out of the bottle. We, you know, it, it, it's something that we're building. And if we get the consensus amongst the people that are building it to build this in a, com a, a, a compassionate and a hum in a way that promotes all of humanity, it's going to be, have a very different outcome. Um, shoot. Uh, how do I go back on these? Just, yeah. Um, so in in giving you a little bit more information about um, the, the test that you're going to take in a little while, uh, as well as um, just kind of uh, what I see as a viable um, scientific model that we could be using as kind of our basis for thinking about AI. Um, it's um, what's called allostatic load. Um, allostatic load was developed by a molecular biologist at Rockefeller by the name of Bruce McEwen. And um, 
it's, it's this network model of how our systems flourish in light of a stressful society. Um, the thinking is that Western civilizations um, are confronted with a level of stress that has never been present in human lives before. You think about, um, you know, people in pre-industrial worlds, you know, in agrarian, even, you know, even in hunter-gatherer um, societies. Um, I mean, there, there were times of intense stress, you know, when the, the tiger was after your ass. Um, but then, you know, you either went away or, you know, you sat under the tree and <laughs> like, ah, that stupid tiger. Um, and you relax. Um, but today, it's kind of the 24-7 the cycle of stress. You know, I, I, you were, when you came in tonight, you were saying how you had to decompress from being on the freeway. I, I mean, we, that's such a common experience for us. Um, you know, and we go from the freeway to you know, a work, or even if we're going home, you know, then we get on the computer to make sure that no, no emails came in. Um, so, you know, it, it, our, our, our system, it, I mean, that's such a, a drag on our system. But we can, we can flourish in that environment if we build up our reserves, basically. Um, and how we build up our reserves um, is the, the topic of the, the test that you guys are, are going to be taking um, in a while. Um, but the reserve principle, um, you, that's coming up, um, built on the basic principle that self-understanding is good. Um, we, it, it, the report that you get from this is, is a lot of information. I, I really, I, I mean, if you're the kind of person that likes a lot of information really quickly, you know, but, you know, it's kind of meant to take it as you want, to, you know, just ingest it at, 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 at your leisure. Um, and, you know, the, the language that, that we try to use is very direct but supportive. Um, and, you know, if you're not feeling supported, even if you're reading something that, you know, is saying you could be doing something better, uh, but you don't feel supported in doing something better, um, it, we're, we have a problem that we'd like to know about. Um, so basically, you know, we're, um, we're kind of, you know, this is going to be the final round of revisions for this, so um, any, any feedback that we could get would be um, hugely helpful. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of what the different areas are that we cover, um, there, there's hexaco uh, feedback. In addition to that, there's what we call system integrity. So how well do you take care of the basic bot? You know, are, 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 are you practicing self-care? 
Are you in decent health? Um, you know, it, 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 it are, do you tend to just by nature worry about, you know, the next earthquake or things that are out of your control? Um, because the more that we can all start with a robust organism, the better we're going to be to live through this stress. Um, if, you know, if we're starting, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the statistics on like losing, you know, a couple hours of sleep at night, you know, I, I mean, you're basically drunk at work the next day. Um, it's not good. Um, so, you know, the, that's kind of what we look at first. The, the second area is emotional reactivity. Um, do your emotions control you or do they guide you? Um, if the emotions control us, that's, that's a tough boss um, because, you know, our emotions are, are so reactive. Um, and it, if we want to maintain consistency, maintain control, uh, keep, keep on a trajectory, um, we, need, we need to take information from our emotions, but we can't let the emotions get down ahead of our brains. Um, and then also how, how good are we at understanding other people's emotions? How good are we at engaging? Um, then the, a lot of, information around relational assets. Um, relations are, without a doubt, one of the major sources of strengths available to us, um, even, even through adulthood. I mean, we have this whole mirror neuron system in our brain that lights up every time we meet someone new. Um, you know, we get into a, we, a new relationship, our brain adjusts to that. It's like, you know, I, I mean, it, pra it, it forces a certain amount of plasticity even in stodgy old brains like mine. Um, so relationships are great resources for us in, in so many different ways. Um, empathy, judgment. Uh, common courtesy, um, all of these help us be, get more from relationships. And then finally, uh, purpose and meaning. Um, and it, you know, this, this is an area of psychology that was by and large kind of avoided until, you know, maybe, what, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, positive psychology um, started to come into vogue. Um, but since then, the literature on the value of taking time to be grateful, to, I, I mean, the simplest example of this, people that, that start journaling um, you know, three, get up in the morning, write down three things that you have that you don't, you didn't earn, you know, you, you just have. Um, be thankful for that. People that do that within a matter of weeks see their blood pressure coming down. Um, you know, it, it has a physical effect on us, just getting out of our own, you know, kind of stressors, and, you know, all the stuff that's, uh, um, you know, keeping us engaged in ourselves. I mean, there, there's a real 
value to disengaging from self. And that almost seems downright on American, right? That, uh, you know, but, but to, to, um, to just let the magnitude of the universe kind of take over for a while. Um, we still don't know what the heck it's doing to the brain, but whatever it is, it, it's good stuff, you know, that, that it kind of, you know, helps our whole organism. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview of, um, of what, um, what you'll have. It's a, uh, it, it's basically just a, a Likert uh, style survey. Um, but before you um, get into that, I'd love to answer any questions. Um, I'm curious to understand two things from your presentation. One of them is, uh, did I get it wrong, right, that when you were talking about the Spotify experience, that you believe it is possible to build empathy into the, into the creations of human beings, the AI, robots, something like that. Did I understand you correctly? Yeah, that, that's not Spotify, but that, that's very much something that I think AI is capable of doing. Yeah, AI is capable of understanding emotions. So next, empathy is just resonating with emotions. So that's, that's already being worked on. Um, um, if you look at it from the point of view that human beings unique is the consciousness. And consciousness is basically made up of energy and information flow. I agree with you, AI is capable of understanding the information flow. However, AI does not have the capability of energy flow the way that right. humans do. Right. So by that, by that token, AI can never come close to the human consciousness. I mean that that's that remains to be seen. I mean most most people would probably dif disagree with you, um, but the the question is, or the point that I wanted to raise is that in in talking about moving forward towards the singularity, towards the potential for AI to start to have that consciousness. Kind of yes, that, that if we do that just in a haphazard kind of black box way that we're training AI now, that we could be doing it in a way to optimize for empathy, that if we start giving machines the understanding of gratitude, of, you know, if, if that's our goal, more than super intelligence, that that's going to change how we develop. So it, it, it's kind of in, yeah, I, 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 no argument that we're not there. But my point is that if we want to, I, I mean, it, it'll, it will or won't get there, we'll, you know, we'll see. One other way that I look at it is if computers can kind of, let's say there's a, an emotional situation, mm -hmm. right, that one would maybe quote unquote consider like an exchange of energy. Right. Um, that could be a computerized, um, uh, conversation that they know kind of each answer and question and depending on where that emotion could lead and it could go down a long rabbit hole that one could consider an exchange of energy but is really 
and which in a lot of ways is That's because there's, there's, there's a human. Though, right? But I mean, that's exchange of information. That's right, there's, amazing. There's an energy behind the creation of that technology. And you know what I'm saying is, that so depending on how you interpret it. For example, I'm in an airport in another country, right. and I'm walking, and then there's suddenly there's a, a there's an image of a woman, and there's right. like a, there's a, there's some sort of like automatically I look and I think right. it's a human, and I'm engaged because I'm seeing a, you know eyes and a face, and, and so and it's helping me find where I need to go, and so there's like a, there's an interaction there. So my point being is, it'll never be us, or maybe like an energy or spirit there, but there's there's a different kind of engagement there that can be, because we know where these rabbit holes can um, can go, can be controlled, or there could be a uh, a setting um, that that could create these type of engagements, you know, through technology. I appreciate what you shared. I think you have you bring a very good point, and I think to your point. I, maybe that super intelligence or super greatness or super empathy, whatever the case is, might not be the path of AI, but the AI might be the path of building that greatness in human beings faster and more effective. I think that is something worth exploring that could elevate our consciousness collectively too as human beings. I, I think consciousness is a state and empathy is a trait. Right, and but, but so the elevation of the level of that can emphasize that the state, right? It can impact that the state. I think they're uh, remarkably different experiences. One's programmable. You can break down empathy as a trait and actually program it in with all its variations. You use artificial intelligence to calculate the infinity of it. Versus consciousness is, could be an energetic state. We're not quite sure what it, what it is and where it emanates from. But we do know it's not created in the brain. It actually is something that is external to the body. And we can talk about that because I think <laughs> mind and brain are very closely related. This is a, it's a great conversation. Me, oh, please. But can I ask you to go back to that, this, if I may? Sure. Or I don't want to take everything. We're running a little bit short of okay. time, but sure. let's, let's, let's one, one more question. Please. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi. Yeah. Thank um, you. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about, a little about the methodology of uh, the test uh, and uh, what is the main difference with uh, Myers Briggs? And uh, the other part of the question is that there are a lot of critique for Myers Briggs that it's not actually like relevant today because uh, it's like the human like, uh, like mm, mental state is very dynamic today so like today you can be like INTJ and tomorrow you will be like ENTP like because right. you like right. something right. changed like, yeah so like what's the what's the dynamic like um, usage um, of that machine learning maybe yeah well um, it, it, it's from a psychometric perspective it, uh, I mean, there's two major components. You need reliability and validity. The, the fact that it doesn't have reliability, the fact that you can take it two different days and 50% of people end up with something different, that, that's problematic. Um, and it's always been that way. It'll always be that way. The, the reason is because it, two of the components are personality traits, but the other two are more emotions uh, and are prone to fluctuation. So it, 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 it's more, it, it, it's a problem of um, mislabeling it, you know, because it, it, if it was labeled as, you know, a test of emotion, you know, then, then it would make sense that you, you, it varies from day to day. You can get reliability estimates different ways. But what it claims to be, to be, you know, something that's informative of your longer term, um, you know, traits, uh, it, has, it has distinct problems in that.
Again, we did, initially we did all our work with uh, married couples, and, uh, and I mean, what, what we found pretty much across the board was um, similarity is much better than, you know, I, I mean, there, there's, the old, there's the old saw, uh, opposites attract, but uh, what we always, uh, ended that with, but then they attacked. <laughs> it's, it's kind of sad but true, I, I think, because, you know, differences are kind of cute for a while, but then it's like, stop leaving the cap off the toothpaste or whatever. So, yeah, it, it I, I kind of a broad-based, um, I, I mean, not a clone, but just general, um, similarity uh, across, um, I, I mean, the, the major, air, most important areas, um, conscientiousness, so your, your degree of organization. Um, values are, are pretty <coughs> important to have consistency. I, I mean, there are some, some cases that, I mean, that, if personality was pretty, pretty solid, um, you could get away with more value differences. Um, it's interesting. Um, it seemed like initially interests weren't that important um, to be aligned, to be well aligned. Um, but it seemed like over time, if couples didn't develop interests that were more aligned, then there were, there were going to be problems um, that, it, you know, for, for the long term, you need to like doing the same things. So. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. All right. If, uh, if you guys want to take that, hang around and take that, it should take 15 minutes or so. My, my suggestion, don't obsess on any one answer. Uh, usually your first you know, impulse is, is just fine. Go with that. Um, keep moving. Um, and then uh, once you get your, your Profile. We can uh, we can talk about uh, talk about that if you want to hang out. Yeah. So again, um, there are four four broad areas. Um, you start out with a uh, getting a, a green, a yellow, or a red. Um, bar at the top, and that basically tells you if you're in the top 30 percent um, or in the middle, the bottom. Who's red? Oh, <laughs> oh it's a healthy group. 30 percent uh, of what? Uh, of the normative population. Um, okay. We. We normed it on um, a population we got from a, a, a research panel um, 
one of the large online research panels. I think um, what, what we're finding, is, particularly since I, I've been working um, through liminal, liminal is a bunch of uh, X uh, seals and really into exceptional performance. So we've had like the San Antonio Spurs and stuff take it. And uh, so I, th I, think, I think it's um, probably normed a bit high. But, we, but we're, we're, all your data will help us figure out uh, what the new norms will look like. Um, but that doesn't mean if you got green, <laughs> shouldn't take it seriously. It, uh, it's a good thing. Um, but um, the system integrity, again, that's overall just how well you're taking care of yourself. Um, if there's anything that jumps out at people, either in a good way or in a bad way, um, I'd love to hear about it. If you're not comfortable talking about it, um, please um, email me um, at galen at siml.co. Um, I appreciate that. So um, the, um, the second large area then is emotional regulation. Again, the thinking, the, the overall reason we find that so important for your, your ability to deal with, with stress um, is that if everything's being reacted from a, an emotional level, um, you really don't have the time to figure out long-term effective strategies. It's always kind of hit or miss um, based on how you're feeling. Um, and, you know, emotions are, are, are important, but they're, they're transient and should be understood as such. Um, and it also, that section gives you information on your emotional IQ um, and how you, how effective you are at understanding other people's emotions um, as a way of, you know, relating more effectively. Um, then it's the social, the relational a assets. Um, a lot of sub areas in there. Um, the, the, way, the way the feedback is generated for this is that on each of these subsections, um, you know, we, we get the, the normative distribution and then we divide that into five sections. And depending on where you fall on the distribution, we have five different scripts. Um, you know, so if you're low, if you're medium, low, medium, there's different, different feedback for all of those. So, um, for each of the subsections, you get one of five. Um, so the net result is very few people are going to get profile or reports that read the same. Um, that, you know, there, there's variation there. Um, and hopefully there's meaningful differences that what what you get it, you know it, it is written totally for what we know about people that that score similarly to to what you do um, so if 
things resonate, if they're helpful, that's great. If, if, we, uh, if we missed it, let us know or let me know. Um, the, um, the final section then is purpose and meaning, um, kind of the, the real higher levels of, of uh, our, our emotional functioning, uh, the compassion, gratitude, those types of areas. Um, but such an amazing resource um, for us across life uh, and certainly in regard to being um, able to manage stress effectively. So that's the reserve principle. Um, we're, uh, like I said, we're going to take it through another iteration and then um, hopefully we'll uh, get some traction with um, athletes and um, folks like that. That's kind of what we're targeting right now. So, so just to summarize, the way we can most help you is if something resonates particularly well or doesn't resonate, so yep. email kalen at .com. Dot co. Dot co and let you know. Yep. Thank you very much.